Good evening, everybody, and it's very good indeed to be at the University of Hertfordshire. Sir Christopher Stoughton practiced at the Commercial Bar from 1958 to 1981. He became a QC in 1970. In 1981, he was appointed to be a High Court judge in the Queen's Bench Division, and from the outset of his judicial career, he was selected to be one of that very small group of judges who sat in the Commercial Court in London. That appointment was made because he'd spent his career as a junior barrister and QC, appearing in commercial litigation in the Commercial Court and in commercial arbitrations. As such, his career was distinguished by outstanding intellectual ability and a fine-tuned analytical facility. His appointment to be a member of the Court of Appeal in 1987 was certainly no surprise. Amongst his many achievements, there was a very minor triumph during 1962 and 1963 when he was a very junior, junior barrister. He put up for a whole year with a pupil who sat in his room trying to prepare pleadings and opinions, which must have been a very little help indeed. I was the pupil. <laughs> I therefore had absolutely no hesitation at all when asked to deliver the first Chris Christopher Stoughton Memorial Lecture in accepting that invitation. When it came to the subject of this lecture, it occurred to me uh, that because I had been at the heart of commercial dispute resolution in London from the year of my pupillage until 2007, when I retired from the commercial court, some 40 years during which Christopher Stoughton had been similarly placed uh, for 35 of those years, it might be interesting to look back for 50 years to when, in 1967, both he and I were junior counsel at the commercial bar and to trace the way in which the routes to commercial dispute resolution in London had changed. Two of those routes to justice, as they existed in 1967, would have been well known to Christopher Stoughton, namely litigation in the commercial court and commercial arbitration. But the third route, would have been quite unknown to, in those days, and indeed might even have been regarded by Christopher Stoughton with overt scepticism. What I'm referring to is ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. The starting point, however, must properly be commercial litigation. To set the scene at the start of the 50 years, it's necessary to look back rather earlier. The commercial list within the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court had been created by resolution of the judges in 1895. Its creation was motivated by two major objectives. Firstly, to create a tribunal which operated with greater speed and efficiency than the ordinary courts of the Queen's Bench Division. The idea was to get away from the unduly formalistic procedures of the ordinary courts which could so easily uh, lend themselves to prevarication and excessively obstructive tactics, and thereby to extensive delays and immense costs. These defects were detested by the London commercial community, which therefore turned increasingly to arbitration as a means of dispute resolution. The objective was to achieve a speedy conclusion to their disputes as inexpensively as possible. Secondly, the distribution of business between the judges of the Queen's Bench Division frequently resulted in the judge assigned to hear a particular commercial trial being completely unfamiliar with the commercial background or the trade in question, because he'd previously been largely occupied by criminal trials out on circuit. So the idea behind the setting up of the commercial list in, 80, 1985, in 1895 was that each year there would be nominated one of, or two judges who would be designated as commercial judges to hear commercial cases and that they would be well versed in commercial activities and commercial law. The first years of the commercial list saw the adoption of extremely flexible procedures 
whose aim was to reach judgment at as early a stage as could fairly be achieved by the use of trials of preliminary issues, frequently with no pleadings, or at most with the briefest, briefest statements of claim by both sides and dispensing with oral evidence. The use of the expression, quote, points of claim, unquote, instead of statement of claim, was intended to reflect brevity in procedure in contrast to the procedure of the ordinary civil courts. Although there's no doubt that this worked for quite a number of years, particularly at the beginning of the 20th century, by the time of the Second World War, it had become seriously eroded as increasingly the very formalistic and time-consuming procedural devices common to the ordinary courts of the Queen's Bench Division had gradually crept into commercial litigation, particularly abstruse and lengthy pleadings. Further, when ordering a case to be transferred to the commercial list, the judges seemed much less proactive in cutting out procedural complexities and in singling out a particular issue to be tried first and separately as a preliminary issue. In the result, the commercial community was increasingly scared off. The number of cases set down for trial in the commercial court plummeted. By 1957, only 15 cases were tried in a whole year in the commercial court. The single commercial judge frequently had nothing to do. You might have thought that would have pleased him enormously, but in fact, he was very fully occupied trying crime or other matters which had absolutely nothing whatever to do with his experience as a commercial lawyer. A report by a commercial court users conference in 1962 pointed to several different reasons for this big decline in work. Among them, foreign trading houses preferred arbitration. The business community had an inherent dislike of publicity and of the procedure of oral evidence by examination and cross-examination of witnesses and costs and delay had increased considerably. It was more difficult to enforce a court judgment abroad than to enforce an arbitration award. Uh, that is because many more states had signed up to the Geneva Convention, which involved the uh, enforcement in overseas countries of arbitration awards in London and other places uh, on a reciprocal basis. Uh, than had permitted enforcement of court judgments and because commercial law principles had been made more certain by the previous decisions of the English courts and thereby increased the process of settlement. <clears throat> As a result of the recommendations of the 1962 Conference on the Commercial Court, the procedure for starting a commercial action which had required the plaintiff to start his claim in the Queen's Bench Division and then apply to the commercial judge for transfer to the commercial list was abolished and replaced by a procedure which had an enormous impact on the work of the commercial court. A plaintiff could now start his claim in the commercial list without first obtaining an order from the judge. At the gateway, was continually open. The summons for transfer was largely abolished and what replaced it was completion of the pleadings within the time limit specified by the rules before the summons for directions in the course of which the judge considered what procedural directions should be given to create an official, an efficient pre-trial procedure. But after all the issues at that stage had already been defined in the pleadings so that the judge could look at the pleadings, could work out what was likely to be an issue between the parties and could take a view on what ought to be done between the time when he heard the summons and the time when the parties might be ready for trial. Whereas in 1966, only 25 cases were listed for trial in the commercial court, by 1974, this had risen to 130. By 2002, there were 277. And subsequently, uh, 
the level of, uh, of uh, cases heard in the commercial court has kept more or less at that level. However, the procedure which operated 50 years ago was strikingly different from that which is now in use. Thus, in 1967, all material issues of fact had to be resolved by calling oral evidence. When a witness of fact had taken the oath, counsel for the party whose witness he was then proceeded to ask questions of the witness designed to enable him to give answers which contained evidence of the relevant facts to be proved by that party. But no leading questions were permitted. It might take many hours to get a witness through his evidence, often by apparently rather oblique questions, carefully crafted not to suggest an answer. Not only did opposing counsel not know <clears throat> for certain before the trial which witnesses were to be called uh, to prove particular facts, but what evidence they were expected to give. Cross-examination of witnesses could therefore not be prepared in advance of the trial so as to cover efficiently and without wasting questions the key matters in issue and often had to be put together by counsel on the hoof. In the result, the taking of all in evidence took a great deal of time. Cross-examinations in which counsel simply banged about in the hope of getting an answer which would lead to something else, which in turn might lead to something which would be of use to his client, uh, were commonplace. Furthermore, expert evidence was not generally exchanged in advance, and there was not usually a procedure for narrowing issues of expert evidence by meeting of the experts, and the production of an expert's report of that meeting identifying matters upon which the experts were unable to agree. In addition to these features, the whole shape of trials in the commercial court was quite different in those days from that which we now know. In particular, counsel for the plaintiff would open the case at great length, not only reading through the pleadings line by line and all the documents, but summarizing the plaintiff's evidence and reading out all the main legal authorities on which the plaintiff relied, as well as rubbishing the defendant's case. Also remember that uh, many of the primary documents had to be reprinted. Um, it was not commonplace at the, right at the beginning of this 50 year period for there to be photocopies or any sort of copies of the primary documents in the case. The text often had to be printed out anew so that it could be used at the trial and read out by counsel. The defendant's counsel then gave the opening speech the plaintiff's witnesses then gave evidence, including the expert evidence. After that, the defendant's counsel called the defendant's witnesses and gave his final speech. This was followed by the plaintiff's counsel's closing speech by way of reply. The judge then went away to write his judgment. This structure was inefficient and unduly time-consuming. With regard to the taking of evidence, both sides were kept largely in the dark as to which opponent's witnesses were to be called and the details of the evidence they were going to give. The opportunity for forensic ambush was obvious. Adjournments might suddenly have to be applied for to obtain further evidence in the face of unexpected testimony by an opposing counsel. This very often involved calling a witness from abroad at short notice. The order of speeches by counsel was also an inefficient procedure. Much of what the plaintiff's counsel said in his opening speech would often have to be revised in the light of the oral evidence from both sides' witnesses when the time came for the plaintiff's final speech. And the law would then have to be gone through all over again. But further, the defendant's counsel would have no opportunity of replying to the plaintiff's final submissions. He would have to anticipate when he gave his final speech what the plaintiff's counsel might subsequently submit. In the course of the last 50 years, this distinctly unwieldy structure of commercial court procedure has been changed to such a considerable extent that it would be largely unrecognizable to an advocate or solicitor of 1967. 
Two, two key motives have produced these, uh, other ch these changes. The need to make commercial litigation less expensive and the need to make the whole conduct of such litigation speedier so as not to occupy such a vast amount of judicial time and to ensure that litigants were given the answer to their dispute as soon as a fair trial is permitted. It's fair to say uh, that even at that time, there was also present an element of competition with international arbitration as an efficient means of dispute resolution. To begin with, the proceedings are now first brought before the commercial judge at a hearing for the giving of directions at a case management conference, which takes place after the pleadings have been completed. The judge can then see from the agreed case management memorandum and the pleadings and from the agreed list of issues exactly what the key issues are and can take a view on how they can be most, in, most efficiently brought to trial and how long it should reasonably take for the parties to prepare the case for trial and for how long the trial would be likely to last. The judge can also then decide whether to order the trial of a preliminary issue, such as the meaning of a particular contractual provision, or whether the trial of quantification of damage should be postponed until after the main substantive issues have been tried and decided. Indeed, one of the most significant changes from the old system is the making of an order at this relatively early stage for the trial to take place in the first available space in the commercial list, not before a given date. This imposes a target on the parties to which they're expected to adhere, so that whatever pre-trial battles may be engaged in, they will not be permitted to drag out the final process of dispute resolution beyond the pre-ordained trial date. This timetable is reinforced by a requirement that at a given time before the fixed trial date, there is to be a progress monitoring date before which each party is to lodge with the clerk to the court a progress monitoring information sheet confirming compliance with the pre-trial timetable and readiness for trial by the trial date. And if not, explaining why and stating what steps are being taken to rectify the delay. The parties must also deliver to the judge a completed pre-trial checklist three weeks before the trial date, confirming that they're up to speed with the preparation of trial bundles, identifying the witnesses to be called and that arrangements have been made for any witness who are giving evidence by video link and giving an estimate of costs of the trial involved and to be incurred. Evidence by video link is now commonplace. In the period during which uh, Christopher Stoughton and I were counsel, it was virtually unknown. But now it's commonplace for witnesses abroad who have only perhaps got half a day's evidence to give, to give their evidence by video link and to be examined and cross-examined by counsel in London, the witness being on the other side of the world. So there is continuing judicial monitoring of readiness for trial. If one party has failed to comply with the timetable prescribed by the court, the matter is brought before the judge and there then can be expected to be imposed very demanding requirements for compliance so as to avoid postponing the start of the trial, which is regarded as absolutely sacrosanct. Serious failure of a party to comply with the timetable can be punished by the judge making costs orders against that party or by refusing to permit last minute introduction of evidence or witnesses. The next key routine procedural change is the making of the order for exchange by a given date of written witness statements to be signed by each witness proposed to be called to give evidence. This makes for a striking change in character of a trial involving witnesses. Thus, unlike the old procedure, except in exceptional cases, where the witness has been sworn and put under oath at the trial, he's simply asked to confirm the accuracy of the contents of his written statement 
and make any minor corrections which might have occurred to him. That statement then becomes his evidence and about which he can then immediately be cross-examined. So the whole concept of examination in chief, which could take hours if not days, um, has gone. And this saves a vast amount of trial time, but doesn't seriously diminish the accuracy of the process of getting at the truth. I have to say here, however, that um, experienced judges, when they heard a witness giving evidence in chief, that is, not being cross-examined, before cross-examination, listening to him giving his evidence in answer to non-leading questions, it was usually pretty clear when he was telling the truth and when he wasn't. The order for directions given at the outset in the course of the case management conference also deals with the calling of expert evidence. Experts' reports are to be exchanged by given dates, and if not agreed, there is to be a meeting of the experts by a particular date when they are to produce a joint memorandum by a further date identifying matters of agreement and disagreement. The object is to narrow down as far as possible the issues of disputed expert evidence to the absolute minimum. The expert witnesses may then in some cases be called to give evidence after all the factual witnesses of both parties have been called so that the experts can direct their evidence to the factual evidence already put before the court by both sides. This simply didn't happen at the beginning of the period that I'm talking about. Finally, in the course of the case management conference, the judge may make what was known as an ADR or mediation order. Such orders did not exist until 1996, and they've since then become a significant feature of procedure, especially in the commercial court. I'll discuss those orders and ADR generally in just a moment. When the proceedings come to trial, the structure of the trial itself now differs from substantially from that which existed 50 years ago. The trial is opened by counsel for the claimant, giving the judge a neutral and non-contentious account of the issues and taking the judge to the main documents. <clears throat> the claimant's witnesses are then called to confirm their witness statement, cross-examined and then re-examined by counsel for the claimant. They're followed by the defendant's factual witnesses called in the same way. The expert witnesses from both parties are then called. Counsel then gives the main speech on behalf of the claimant, referring to the evidence and the law. Next, the defendant's counsel gives the main speech for the defendant. And finally, the claimant's counsel makes his closing speech. This trial structure has been found to give rise to much greater efficiency in the general conduct of the trial itself. Apart from cutting out the time-consuming process of examination in chief of witnesses, it facilitates the preparation beforehand of much more efficient cross-examination. If you know what the opposing side's witnesses are going to say in advance, you've got a jolly good basis for deciding what probing questions to put to him when he comes up in the witness box to be cross-examined. <clears throat> I mentioned evidence being given by video link, and as I've said, this has become an increasingly common practice, and it serves a most enormous amount of time. It's proved an effective way of saving costs by avoiding bringing foreign witnesses to London. However, I found, uh, when judging, uh, that if the witness had more than about two or three hours evidence to give, the use of a video link tended to be rather um, difficult to operate, although on occasion it's unavoidable where the witness is tied down on the other side of the world and simply can't make the journey to London. So a modern commercial court trial is a much more efficient exercise in dispute resolution than it was 50 years ago. Not only have the procedures been made less time-consuming in court, however, but the ethos of the commercial court as developed in its very early days, has been both continued and, in many respects, reinforced. The judges are drawn from those who, at the bar, were widely experienced in practices of the commercial world. 
but who are very willing to retain a highly flexible approach to dispute resolution from the first moment when the case comes to court at the case management conference. For one party to rely on obstructive procedural points is regarded with as much disfavour now as it was in 1895. <coughs> that great chancery judge and law lord, Lord Wilberforce, described the commercial court as, and I quote, the jewel in the crown of the English legal system, unquote. A description which by the end of my 50 years period is an accurate reflection of the international reputation of the court. The case law made by the commercial judges and the certainty of legal principle which they contributed, as well as the quality of their judicial conduct, go a long way to explaining why international commercial contracts all over the world include a reference of all disputes arising under them to English court jurisdiction, or at least provide that the contract is governed by English law. Sir Christopher Stoughton was a significant contributor to that reputation. I've already mentioned ADR orders being made by commercial judges as part of the first order for directions. Such orders are a key part of a whole instrument of dispute resolution which has developed since Sir Christopher Stoughton left the commercial court on his appointment to the Court of Appeal in 1987. Alternative dispute resolution, ADR, comprehends two distinct processes, mediation and early neutral evaluation. Mediation essentially involves a mediator, agreed upon by the parties to a dispute, conducting discussions with both parties present and with each party separately of the matters in issue and of the strengths and weaknesses of each party's case and, against that background, making suggestions as to the terms of settlement which that mediator regards as likely to be acceptable to both parties, the object being to point both parties to common ground by narrowing down their differences uh, by discussion with them. The target is a settlement in place of litigation, or at least in place of an impending trial. ENE, or early neutral evaluation, which is much less commonly used than mediation, involves the evaluator, usually a judge or a Queen's counsel, hearing either orally or on paper alone, each side's presentation of its case with regard to issues of evidence and law, and then providing the parties with the evaluator's considered answer to the matters in issue, but without conducting a trial as such. The result is not binding on the parties, but the idea is that if an experienced judicial brain has arrived at a provisional view of the issues, the parties will be encouraged to arrive at a settlement by taking that conclusion into account. The evaluator's view is not binding unless the parties agree that it should be. It's simply a persuasive tool for settlement. The first alternative dispute resolution orders were made in the commercial court in 1996. They were normally treated as referring to mediation rather than to ENE, early neutral evaluation. It was decided by the commercial judges that those orders should not be in mandatory form because the mediation process was essentially consensual. The ground for such an order is laid by requiring the parties to answer in their case management information sheet, which they must provide to the court before the case management conference to which I've already referred, a series of questions aimed at concentrating the minds of the parties on the possibility of referring their disputes to ADR. For example, has the use of ADR been considered between the party and its legal representatives? Or has its use been explored with the opposing party? And whether an ADR order in the usual form would be appropriate? <clears throat> the usual form of order as set out in the commercial court guide has remained largely unchanged since it was first introduced. It was drawn up by the judges with two primary objectives, to make the parties really try to use ADR to settle their dispute, while at the same time, both making that course non-mandatory and making it very hard for them to refuse to try. 
Thus the order ran, quote, the parties shall take such serious steps as they may be advised to resolve their dispute by ADR, unquote, while also requiring that if they fail to do so, they must inform the court in writing, stating without prejudice to matters of privilege, why they had failed to resolve their dispute by ADR. I must confess I'm wholly liable for the formulation of the wording of that order. It was also decided by the judges from the outset that the judges themselves should not act as mediators. That was because, were they to do so, the parties would not be able to impart to them confidential information which might be very material in achieving a successful mediation. If the judge were given that information, he would immediately be disabled from trying the case because, of course, that information would be privileged and known particularly to the party concerned. <coughs> the making of ADR orders and the point of time before the trial when they kick in is very much a matter of judicial discretion. A typical case for the making of such an order is where the costs of proceeding to trial are likely to be large compared with the amount of the claim or where the parties have had or but for the dispute would have had in future an ongoing commercial relationship which could be deployed as part of a settlement agreement such as the relationship between a supplier of parts and a manufacturer. Sometimes it may be productive of settlement to make an order referring a particular issue to mediation. On rare occasions, the judge may make an ADR order where both parties either oppose or do not consent to the making of such an order. That's unusual, but the remarkable thing about it is that in such cases, the making of such an order has not infrequently led to a settlement. Indeed, experience shows that in the face of an ADR order, extreme scepticism and apparently entrenched antagonism again and again gives way to settlement. The interesting thing about the phenomenon of willingness to settle is that it very often only becomes apparent sometime after the mediation hearing has been held and no settlement has been reached, both parties having walked out on the mediator. Indeed, it's probably true to say that a major, a major impact of the introduction of ADR orders has been that many cases which but for a mediation would have settled at the door of the court now settle at a much earlier stage on the pre-trial journey. Before leaving ADR, there's one really important explanation which needs to be given. The question is why the judges should be so keen on making these orders. The answer lies in the second of Lord Wolfe's access to judgment reports in 1996. From that there was derived the concept of what was called the overriding objective. This was expressed in rule one of the civil procedure rules and they state these rules are now a new procedural code with the overriding objective of enabling the court to deal with cases justly. And then justly is then defined, for example, as ensuring that the parties are on an equal footing, saving expense, dealing with the case in ways which are proportionate to the amount involved, to the importance of the case, to the complexity of the issues, to the financial position of each party. And then finally, allotting to it an appropriate share of the court's resources while taking into account the need to allot resources to other cases. Then in Rule 1.3, um, the code provides the parties are required to help the court to further the overriding objective. Now, ADR orders entirely reflect this procedural philosophy. Although these orders are directed to compliance with the overriding objective, they do not force on the parties the achievement of a settlement. What they do is to require parties to make the effort to settle, albeit those efforts may be completely fruitless. However, the Court of Appeal has now held that at least in some cases, if a party unreasonably refuses to comply with an ADR order, or indeed simply with a request by an opposing party to go to mediation, it is open to the court to order that the winning party should not recover from the losing party the whole or part of the winning party's costs. 
Now, speaking for myself, I find this conceptually indigestible. After all, all the winning party is doing by refusing mediation is insisting on the enforcement of rights to which he's clearly entitled by definition. It's hard to see why a party is obliged to enter upon a procedure likely to involve him in giving up his rights in order, quote, to further the overriding objective, unquote, in the words of Rule 1.3. There are many hundreds of fully trained and accredited mediators in London alone. The facilities for mediation training did not exist when Sir Christopher Stoughton was a commercial, commercial judge. Indeed, mediation resulting from commercial disputes or litigation was virtually non-existent. So this is a whole new field of dispute resolution. Indeed, the main commercial law solicitors now include specially trained lawyers who have developed mediation expertise so as to enable them to advise and represent their clients before mediators. That finally brings me to commercial arbitration. At the time when my period begins, London was already firmly established as a world centre for maritime arbitration. It was also a major centre for arbitration of sale and purchase disputes, particularly in the grain and cereals trade, edible oils such as soybean oil, animal feed substances and minerals for fertilisers, as well as in metals. The main explanation for this preeminence was in each of these trades, standard form contracts were used, which usually incorporated a clause providing for English law as the governing law of the contract and for arbitration of all disputes in London, often in accordance with the rules of a particular trade association, such as the Grain and Feed Trades Association or the London Metal Exchange. These trade associations had their own arbitration rules, However, the shipping industry at that time had no equivalent detailed arbitration rules. At that time, it had no comparable trade association, which has its own arbitration system and rules. Indeed, the standard forms of charter party and bills of lading issued by the Baltic Exchange did not incorporate London arbitration clauses, and those contract forms were used for the carriage of goods by sea and the chartering of ships throughout the world. The structure of arbitrations conducted within the commodity associations was very self-contained. Several of them provided for two-tier arbitration. That is to say, a first instance hearing before a tribunal of three arbitrators who were not normally lawyers, but people from the trade in question. And then an appeals tribunal, often before a panel of several trade people which might be assisted by a solicitor or legal advisor. To those familiar with modern arbitration practice, these arbitral tribunals worked in a rather remarkable way. The claimant and respondent each appointed an arbitrator. The two arbitrators then met and discussed the parties' positions. If they agreed, they made an agreed award. If they did not agree, they appointed a third arbitrator or umpire, and the two arbitrators then argued as advocates before him, presenting their respective client's case. The third arbitrator then decided the case and they made an award accordingly. At that point, the losing party could appeal to the appeals panel. The hearing before the appeals panel not infrequently took the form of the original two arbitrators again acting as advocates to prevent their party's case. The appeals panel then usually turned over the ruling, the writing of the award, to the solicitor or counsel who'd been retained and appointed to advise it. Several of the commodity associations didn't permit a solicitor or barrister to appear as advocates, either at all or unless the appeal tribunal gave special permission. Many of the trade associations have over the, the years amended their rules to the effect that legal representation at all hearings is much more readily available, particularly before appeal tribunals. It was, however, the maritime arbitrations that followed a procedure more similar to arbitrations today. Standard forms of charter parties of ships and of bills of lading in use throughout the world, as well as ship sale construction contracts, incorporated English law. 
And many, time, on many occasions, they also included arbitration clauses which the parties added in involving arbitration in London, as they still do. Most of those arbitrations were conducted in those days in front of two arbitrators and an umpire. The umpire, having been appointed by the party-appointed arbitrators, had no jurisdictional function whatever, unless and until the party-appointed arbitrators disagreed. So the curious practice developed of hearings being conducted before the arbitrators and the umpire who sat behind a notional curtain until the point came when the other two disagreed over a pre-hearing application or the award itself. The umpire then, as it was said, entered on the reference and in effect his decision determined the result. The volume of work undertaken by maritime arbitrators throughout my 50-year period has been enormous and most of the arbitrations have been conducted throughout by a very small group of experienced arbitrators, many of whom were not lawyers but rather retired ship's masters or marine surveyors or engineers. Many of these arbitrations involved quite difficult issues in relation to seaworthiness, the stowage of cargo or alleged ship's engine or pumping defects or ship construction. The small group of maritime arbitrators who sat most regularly brought to bear a wealth of experience of the carriage of cargo by sea. Some in those days, but not many, had legal training. But those who didn't have legal training were remarkably speedy in picking up the most sophisticated legal concepts from the decided cases, many of which were handed down by the commercial court. Some idea of the volume of arbitrations before maritime arbitrators can be derived from the number of awards by full members of the London Maritime Arbitrators Association over the period from 1983. I couldn't get records from before that. In that year alone, there were 700 awards. In later years, there were fewer, but up to 2008, most years saw over 400 awards issued by members of that association. I've so far been referring to commercial arbitrations involving disputes in relatively specialist trade, as distinct from that very large area of commercial disputes arising out of the international sale and purchase of other kinds of goods and services than, than ships, as well as the sale and purchases of companies, joint venture agreements, mineral extraction conception, concessions, oil and gas supply contracts, insurance and reinsurance policies, and contracts, and so on. Arbitrations of international disputes arising in relation to that very large general area of commercial transaction was very often uh, involving cross-border issues were heavily concentrated in, if not dominated by, the International Chamber of Commerce, the ICC system, which was based in Paris. So if you entered into a long-term contract for the supply of oil from the Middle East to Europe, or coal from Indonesia, or for the operation of international hotel chain, it very often provided for all disputes to be referred to arbitration in Paris under the rules of the ICC. By the beginning of my period, although there was some international commercial arbitration of the kind of disputes I've described in London, a whole dispute resolution industry had grown up in Paris based on ICC arbitration. There was also a sub substantial body of arbitration, international arbitration, conducted in Switzerland. Viewed from London, this seemed to be a rich field for the provision of legal services. For many of these international arbitrations were extremely remunerative, not least because they often involved massive preparation and long hearings. In the event, lawyers in the London profession began to turn their minds to setting up a rival arbitration market to challenge the supremacy of Paris. The result was that, driven by leading London commercial lawyers, particularly Lord Justice Carr, it was decided to revive the more or less moribund London Court of Arbitration as an engine for competing with Paris. This court had originally been set up by the City of London Corporation and the London Chamber of Commerce jointly in 1895. It was, however, not until 1975 
that the Institute of Arbitrators, now the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, together with the London Chamber of Commerce and the City of London Corporation, combined to provide for the administration of the London Court of Arbitration, and then, in 1981, changed its name to the London Court of International Arbitration, now known as the LCIA. The following year, the LCIA became a private and not-for-profit company, fully independent of the three founding bodies. The previous year, it had promulgated its first set of arbitration rules, and similarly to the ICC, it set up the LCIA court. That didn't have the function of resolving substantive disputes, referred to LCIA arbitration. Rather, it had an in-house function. It was the final authority for application of the LCIA rules. It appoints arbitral tribunals. It determines challenges to arbitrators, particularly prevalent nowadays, on the grounds of perceived bias or conflict of interest. And it has a further function of approving costs of arbitrations. Importantly, however, although it has up to 35 members selected to provide and maintain a balance of leading practitioners in commercial arbitration from the major trading areas of the world, not more than six may be of UK nationality. This reflects the transnational purpose of the LCIA. By means particularly of the flexibility and lack of formalization in its prescribed procedure for arbitrations subject to the LCIA rules, by its outward looking approach to dispute resolution, exemplified by the many international arbitration workshops, conferences, and seminars which it operates and oversees, uh, oversees as well as in London, and by the efficiency uh, of the, its administrative system and its excellent premises in Fleet Street, the LCIA has now become a rapidly growing dispute resolution organization and a very powerful rival to Paris in the field of international commercial arbitration. Think of this. Up to 1996, there were fewer than 30 LCIA arbitrations commenced in any year. But there then began a rapid expansion in popularity. In the two-year period from January 1999 to the end of 2000, there were 147 cases referred to the LCIA arbitration. But in 2010 alone, that had risen to 248 cases. And in the period 2014 to 2015, 634 disputes were referred. This is obviously the effect of the rapidly increasing use of LCIA arbitration clauses in international commercial contracts. If you don't have such a clause, you don't generally get to LCIA arbitration unless the parties specially agree once a dispute has arisen. This enormous caseload has been accompanied by a very considerable increase in the number of London solicitors and barristers engaged almost exclusively in the pre preparation and presentation of international arbitrations in London, whether we're marine or non-marine. Major law firms have formed substantial arbitration teams. A leading London law firm, for example, from 1963 to 1967 had but one partner dealing intermittently with non-marine arbitration. During the 1970s and 1980s, there were two primary arbitration partners. However, by the 1990s, there were four partners and 16 associate solicitors engaged in arbitration. By 2011, there were five partners and 24 associates. By no means all of these arbitrations were LCIA cases or involved in the true sense commercial disputes. But these figures are consistent with an absolutely massive increase in London international arbitration work generally. The bulk of it of very commercial nature. The non-marine international commercial arbitration scene has therefore completely changed from the very limited operation to be found in the 1960s to the massive international network based in London, which we find today, and which makes a very considerable contribution to this country's invisible exports. Before leaving international commercial arbitration, it's necessary to refer to one particular and momentous development 
in the relationship between arbitration and the commercial court. <clears throat> it was on the 15th of August, 1979, when Sir Christopher Court Sorton was a leading QC, the commercial bar, that the Arbitration Act 1979 took effect. That legislation was primarily the result of what had come to be regarded by many in the commercial community and the legal profession as a serious defect in the administration of English commercial law. That was the notorious Section 21 of the 1950 Arbitration Act. It provided that an arbitrator or umpire might and should have so directed by the High Court state any question of law arising in the course of a reference or an award or any part of an award in the form of a special case for the decision of the High Court. This procedure would seem to, on the face of it, to provide a reasonable, sim reasonably simple and unobjectionable safety mechanism enabling the court to assist the arbitral tribunal in resolving difficult points of law. However, the courts adopted a very relaxed approach to the operation of Section 21. The Court of Appeal held that in order for a party to an arbitration to obtain from the court an order directing arbitrators to state a special case, it was enough to show that there was a real and substantial point of law appropriate for decision by a court, the resolution of which was necessary for the proper determination of the case. The court then proceeded to permit special cases to be stated on any point of law unless it was absolutely unarguable or was made in bad faith. Sometimes this produced an absolutely outrageous general issue or cluster of issues, such as, quote, whether on the facts found by the award the respondent is liable for damages for breach of contract with the claimant. This procedure was both highly impractical and, as it became, a vehicle for abuse. It was impractical because the parties were required to request the tribunal to make the award in the formal special case before it was known what findings of fact had been made. So the questions of law set out in the request often had to be speculated at that point of time. The questions could consequently be completely misdirected or indeed totally irrelevant. If the arbitrator take the view, took the view that a party was asking questions which were, were misdirected and therefore refused to produce an award in the form of a special case, in respect of those questions, the party could then apply to the court to order the, party, the arbitrator to do so. The, but the court wouldn't know at that stage what finding of the fact the arbitrator had proposed to make. So this was a very unsatisfactory feature of the whole of English arbitration law, which operated as a serious interference with the a target of improving the part played by English uh, commercial law in international arbitration. It was therefore regarded as another factor attracting international arbitrations away from London. This was particularly so because the opportunity it gave to parties with a weak case to delay an arbitration award against them, offering often for months or years, while the special case went first to the court, then not infrequently to the Court of Appeal and even to the House of Lords. There was also an increasingly serious public interest factor involved. This was the fact that the commercial court list became completely clogged up with pending special cases. That came particularly to the fore in the 1970s as a result of the price volatility in the United States market in edible oils, and particularly soybean oil, which were treated under standard contracts providing for English arbitration. Well, the Arbitration Act 1979 abolished all that, abolished the, the special case procedure and replaced it with an appeal system, the one which we now have under Section 69 of what is now the Arbitration Act 1996. And this system represents really a compromise between the objective, the finality of arbitration awards on the one hand, and the reluctance of the judiciary altogether to abandon the court's supervisory control of decisions by arbitrators on points of law. That reluctance by the judiciary was based on the fact that by decisions on special cases stated by arbitrators, 
the courts had over the years been enabled to develop many of the most important principles of English commercial law. For example, to take just one, the uh, concept of anticipatory breach of contract. In a nutshell, awards now had to have reasons attached to them, and the reasons could then be used as the basis for making an application for permission to appeal to the court. These uh, permissions have been very reluctantly provided. Um, the general approach has been that unless the issue of law was one which was one of general public importance, the court would not um, give permission unless it felt that the arbitrator was probably wrong in the decision which he'd arrived at. My own view is that these concerns about um, the um, abolition of the special case and the substitution of the English, what is now the English uh, appeal system, um, are really overdone. If there is an issue, a point of law, which is likely to recur in a particular commercial context, and as to which there are serious doubts as to whether the arbitral tribunal got it right, the approach which certainly I adopted as a judge and which I believe is still now generally followed, is to treat that point of law as one of, quote, general public importance, unquote. The ju judicial system has thus worked reasonably well. Permission to appeal has been given only in a very small proportion of applications for such permission, and only when a difficult issue of law has arisen on which, at first blush, the tribunal may well have gone wrong. So although the 1979 Act appeal system has not led to total finality, it has done so in most English law arbitrations. So there it is, the commercial court getting busier and still making major contributions to the development of commercial law. Mediation born and brought up and flourishing as an independent means of dispute resolution. And international arbitration ever growing with an international reputation worldwide for reliability and impartiality. That, I suggest, is not a bad record of achievement for 50 years of dispute resolution since Sir Christopher Thornton was an up-and-coming junior counsel and subsequently contributing to it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sir Anthony, what a tour de force. Um, Sir Anthony has agreed to take some questions, if any of you have questions for him at this time. If you're uh, asking a question, there are some roving microphones. If you could give your, uh, your name just prior to asking your question. Yes, there's one up at the back there. And while we're getting a microphone to you, can I kick off by asking you, um, uh, you, you as you were elaborating your, uh, your story, you suggested that Paris had become a centre for arbitration until was it the LCIA established and essentially wrestled, wrestled some of that activity into London. Is London now the lead and is that likely to stay that way with Brexit? It's very difficult to predict that. Um, my own feeling is that uh, the London arbitration scene is so firmly established and the infrastructure is so well developed in London, particularly amongst the leading law firms and amongst the body of arbitrators available and the way in which the LCIA operates, that um, although international arbitrations are frequently held in Paris and there are very, very many of them, ICC arbitrations and in Zurich and elsewhere, London will continue even after Brexit, whatever that involves, hard or soft, um, as a major international arbitration centre. It's very hard to see that everything will suddenly dissolve overnight. I can't see that happening. I can't even see it happening gradually, frankly. Good, good. Yes, please. Thank you, sir, um, for the wonderful le lecture, especially from someone who has got so much experience in practice. Uh, my question is specifically in relation to to the points you raised, um, 
concerning the restrictions on them getting permission to appeal to the, to the Court of Appeal, basically on, only on point of law of uh, public importance. How do you balance that with um, the common notion that um, the court is the last hope of the um, common man, and if the common man is unable to take his case, if, it has, if he's not happy with the, the court of first instance, take his case to the court of appeal and to the Supreme Court just because of the principle that his case does not raise or his, or his appeal does not raise uh, any principle of public importance. I, I think I can deal with that uh, quite shortly. The, the, the public importance concept has, I think, perhaps been um, made a little flexible by the judges um, in the context of international arbitrations, which are held in London, and particularly in the context of applications for permission to appeal. Uh, the approach which um, I canvassed and which um, I think was adopted by most of the commercial judges was that, okay, uh, the courts basically should keep out of arbitrations, but uh, the Act uh, provided for um, a, a certain leeway where the court uh, considered that there was a matter of public importance uh, raised by an issue of law. Now, um, public importance, of course, is a very flexible concept if you think about it. What public uh, in that context? Why should it not simply be the public who happen to be members of the London Metal Exchange? Why should it not be the public who are members of the Grain and Feed Trades Association? Why should it not be the public who are uh, involved in the shipping industry? And so um, we approached this whole flexibility um, on the basis that you could use that part of the Act uh, to provide for the court taking a view that, well, if something is, looks a bit dicey and um, it's open to question whether they got it right, we'll allow the appeal, we'll allow the permission to appeal. I think that's the approach which um, seemed at the time, and I hope it still does, to be the sensible one. Yes, please, right up there. Hi there, thank you once again, Sir Anthony Coleman, for your lecture tonight. Uh, my question regards uh, the de deregulation of uh, the financial services industry uh, during the 1980s and whether or not the commercial arbitration that's been focused and the influx towards uh, respondent-friendly London uh, as a center for that has been more so seen because of the fact that financial services have been deregulated since 1980 and onwards. And if more cases for commercial arbitration have been centered towards London uh, because it's been far more respondent friendly in the sense that uh, cases have been focused towards London for that matter, or if London is purely based off of its uh, own merits been brought into the sense that uh, commercial arbitration has been centered there for its uh, prestige in the area. Uh, more so relating to, has the influx of commercial arbitration been focused to London because of the fact that financial services has widely expanded uh, since the 1980s to early 2007 when you ended your tenure? I th I'm, I'm no. not sure whether the microphone was on at your end, but it wasn't coming over to me. <laughs> I think, can I, can I say what I think you were asking? Please. It's, it's about financial deregulation and whether financial deregulation have in been London more centered towards London during that period of had, 20 had or 30 years. The, the, the sort of developments which you were, I think, elucidating in your, in your talk. Is that correct? Yes, that, that's exactly correct. I don't think it's had much effect, frankly, or at least none that I've been um, conscious of. If it has had an effect, that, that effect must have been brought to bear uh, very recently, but certainly while I was judging, and indeed in the various international arbitrations in which I've been involved, I've not been, in, not been conscious of it having any effect at all. The reason why I ask is because um, most is the master, master agreements uh, regarding certain financial services and advanced financial contracting uh, have usually used uh, 
choice jurisdiction laws uh, focused towards London, specifically for places of alternative dispute resolution uh, for commercial disputes. And I was just wondering if there was a, a trend that you've noticed uh, during your tenure that would kind of link between the highly, uh, the more cases that have brought, been brought forward towards London as opposed to not, uh, based on the fact that financial services have sort of expanded more during that time. I hope I'm getting through, uh, and I'm, there's not. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think you're just asking if there was a if you if we've seen a Certainly. trend. Yeah, that's exactly associated with deregulation of financial services in London, with the sort of arbitration uh, uh, um, activity which has occurred. But I think your answer was not really. It's, it's absolutely probably happening independently. Absolutely, um, you'd be surprised. Um, You'd be surprised how little uh, disputes um, involving the financial services industry actually get to fighting arbitrations. Um, the industry is basically one which, um, or the financial services area, is basically one in which disputes tend to be settled at an early stage. The, the, the big field of arbitral disputes which are handled in London, are disputes which are of a transnational nature in the sense that um, you'll get typically a particular party in one country, very often not Britain, against another party in some other part of the world, very often Russia. Um, and um, the, the, um, the concept of London financial services or financial services even in Europe being involved in this um, is uh, remote in my experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please, in the center there. And while the microphone's going to you, if I could ask one more. Um, you you um, essentially, as I understood the, the, the sort of fundamental um, um, thesis that you were putting forward is that it, since 1895 pro procedures and processes have been uh, refined in terms of arbitration, in terms of the law of, uh, of commerce. In other words, uh, uh, process and bureaucracy has decreased. How do you, s I may be over-interpreting what you said, but how do you see that moving forward in the future? Is it likely that there will be further decrease in bureaucracy associated with these sort of disputes? I don't think bureaucracy has really had much to do with it and did indeed have much to do with it in the 19th century. Um, the problem in the 19th century and indeed all the procedural problems <clears throat> which afflicted uh, dispute resolution uh, then and survived into the 20th century uh, tended to be derived from um, those lawyers who were responsible for drafting the Judicature Acts in the 1870s, who were basically chancery lawyers. And everybody who knows anything about the Chancery Court will know that it was a byword for obfuscation and for excessive procedural nicety. Uh, what mattered there was much more whether an affidavit had been tied up with the right colored tape rather than um, what the substance of the issues between the parties might be. And it's to get away from that excessive formalistic approach to the conduct of litigation of a whole structure of the commercial court and its procedures and um, everything to do with it has been developed. Um, the idea is go for the jugular, get at the real issues and get at it as soon as possible, and get it resolved as soon as possible, and as cheaply as possible. Mm, good. Now, I think I've got two, and then we'll call it a day. One in the, in the center here, please. Sir Anthony, you've alluded to the economic benefits that have flowed to London through the considerable development of mediation, arbitration, and the more traditional commercial courts. As a simple member of the public who has no training in law, I, I have struggled to understand how the economic benefits actually work through to the GNP or the GDP or whatever measure the economists would choose. I understand, of course, that both plaintiffs and defendants pay their lawyers 
and probably pay them well, and no doubt justifiably so. Do those plaintiffs and defendants, many of them coming from outside the UK, actually pay for the courts themselves? Or are the charges, the costs of the court service, borne by the taxpayer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the fees which um, um, parties now pay to the court, I believe, now cover the costs of operating the court. I may be wrong about that. They did several years ago. Um, I think by the time I ceased to be a commercial judge, they'd jacked up the fees quite considerably. And uh, at that time, they just about covered the cost of operating the commercial court. That cost is considerable. It's considerable because you need, because of the volume of work, you need eight judges to be on hand um, more or less all the time. Because although there are a lot of trials, there are also a lot of hearings, there's a lot of paperwork, decisions on papers and so on. And my belief is that when a fee is paid um, by a litigant, uh, that fee um, taken overall is enough to pay for um, certainly the estate, the availability of the, the, the premises, and also um, the judges themselves who are involved. I may be wrong about that. Um, things may have changed, but I believe that's the position now. Yeah. Michael, did you have a question? I think that's the last one, if we could. A simple question. Does uh, alternative uh, dispute resolution by means of mediation work in a commercial dispute where the central allegation is one of fraud? I'd never make a mediation order in a case in which fraud was alleged. I don't think I've ever done that. Um, it's, um, it's not an encouraging prospect. It might work. Um, Mediation works in the most un unlikely circumstances, but um, it's uh, too much of a hostage to fortune, I think. The parties ought to get on with the litigation and get the fraud out of their system, um, really, in front of a judge. I don't, um, I don't subscribe to the view that mediation is necessarily the best course for all litigation. I think a fraud case is probably an exception. Thank you very much. Now, I have two uh, uh, very pleasant duties to do before I invite um, Sam Richards onto the stage who's going to give the vote of thanks. And the uh, very pleasant uh, duties are to invite Joanna Stoughton if she'd like to come on stage. We have a little bouquet for her. But I also have for Sir Anthony a little present from the university which is uh, a piece of glass which has been prepared by one of our graduates, Karen Murphy, uh, which we would be delighted if you would take from us. Thank you. And if Joanna and uh, uh, um, Sir Anthony would now like to go and have a seat, I'm going to invite uh, uh, Sam Richards to come on stage to give a vote of thanks. Sam. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor. Uh, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as a second year law student here at the university, it is a pleasure to have been asked to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion. Um, 
I'd like to be on behalf of everyone here tonight. Um, thank you sincerely to uh, Santony Coleman for delivering his views and opinions on the diverse routes of justice that are uh, available to the commercial area of law, and most notably, commercial uh, dispute resolution in London, our capital, over the last 50 years. Uh, the experience Sir Anthony Coleman has spoke of in his lecture today is something that me and my peers, some of which are here tonight, is only something that we can hope to encounter in our future careers if, if we meet them. Um, uh, therefore, um, to have such a thorough, extensive look back over his um, last 50, 50 years as well with how it has worked is a pleasure. Uh, alternative dispute resolution is something that is a precious tool in law and it works very well with the area of commercial law, not so much with fraud um, <laughs> that we've learnt. Um, however, um, to see the humble beginnings of it in maritime law and how it's advanced into aspects such as arbitration and mediation is uh, such w a wonderful thing to see. Um, so before we begin and depart, before we end and depart tonight, um, I'd like to thank a few notable people. Um, without getting too personal, I'd like to thank uh, Sir Christopher Stoughton and Lady Stoughton um, for not only his contributions to the commercial area of law, but also the contributions in which are made to the University of Hertfordshire's School of Law, um, which I've been a pleasure to be on the end of uh, with the scholarship. Uh, it's benefited me greatly. Thank you. And of course, uh, Anthony Coleman tonight for giving such a thorough, extensive, all-inclusive speech on the topic. Thank you. I wish you all a safe journey home. Thanks.